Welcome to the Smith Publicity, all things book marketing podcast, the best tips, insights, and advice from the best in the publishing industry. Hello, I'm Dan Smith, and today for this podcast, we're going to be talking with three of our all-star publicists, um, and I'll let you quickly introduce yourself, publicists, go. Hi, this is Michaela Delamonica, um, a frequent <laughs> host on this podcast, but now I'm joining as a guest. Um, I've been with Smith for a little over a year now, doing uh, publicity all across all across genres, fiction, nonfiction, business, self-help. And Mallory? Yes. I'm Mallory Campoli. <coughs> I've been with Smith for almost two years, and I've been do I do a lot of my work with business, nonfiction, and memoirs. But uh, I've been in book publicity itself for about three or four years. And I'm Andrea Thatcher. I'm a little bit more behind the scenes on the podcast and marketing efforts. And um, I've been in the book industry for about seven or eight years in various aspects of book selling and marketing and publicity, and I'm very excited with everything that we're doing here at Smith. Great. So, again, this is just going to be an informal conversation sometimes with the best, uh, sometimes with the best way to get some really uh, neat discussion going. And um, so I'll throw out the question and I'll start, you know, I'll start with uh, Mallory. Um, can you in in being a book publicist, what what do you think are the the key elements of a publicist? The uh, key characteristics of a great publicist. Um, you know what 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 does a publicist need to be very effective at her job? I, I think the most important thing is you have to be I think a strong writer. You need to be able to make some a story interesting and relevant to the media which is often hard something can be interesting to you know the mass audience but it's not necessarily interesting to the media so i think that's a big part of it being on you know learning how to make things concise writing in a clear and you know efficient manner uh, you also have to be very you know friendly and you you learn well, working well with people well, what do you guys think about um how important are phone skills? Back in the day, my dinosaur days, most of the things were done by phone. We always, um, I mean, 90, 80% of our pitching was done by phone um, back in 20 years ago. So now it's obviously very different. But to any of you, and again, just jump in, how important is, how important are phone skills today? Yeah, I mean, this is Michaela. I think that uh, and I've heard this um, within the industry, um, been said before, in, in the entertainment industry to be exact, it's 80% personality and 20% skill. So your personality could get you a long way, whether it's picking up the phone and calling that media contact that could be a little intimidating over email. Um, but once you you know switch gears and, and turn that personality hit, hat on, um, you know things could go a long way. And, you know, just having that rapport with your client as well, um, you know, that, that fun engagement um, before you jump into, um, you know, the work tasks ahead. Um, I think having that friendly rapport that Ma Mallory just mentioned um, could definitely go a long way for the campaign and, too. And, and Andrea, I mean, maybe it's a case where um, it's kind of morphed from where phone skills were so important with the media, but they still are. But maybe even more so now with clients, um, and you know, cl prospective clients or clients often ask us in the sales process, you know, are your publishers always on the phone, and um, you know, do you still have these phone contacts? And we're very, you know, honest, obviously, and realistic with them, and say that a lot of media prefer email; they don't want to be called. However, once once they express interest, that can lead to phone calls with the producer and editor. And uh, Andrea, how? How important, or I mean, it's important, but how often, and um, how often do you use your phone skills for the media? Not client relations are a whole nother thing, but with the media, whether from pitching or after you get interest in. 
I think, and I think this relates back to some of the things that make a good publicist. I think you need to know your outlet and know the people you're pitching. You might know that the person at People Magazine is not going to answer your phone call, but they do tend to read your emails. So you know to pitch that person a certain way, whereas you know that somebody at CNN doesn't really skim your emails and doesn't really take it in, but if you give a phone call, then that prompts them to relook re at your materials. And I think that's a really useful way to use the phone is to reintroduce your topic, your, your author, your press materials to a contact who maybe wasn't responsive. And I think a lot of times you'll find that they are interested, especially when you can react to their response on the phone and maybe switch gears or change tactics or bring in a new angle if you can sense over the phone that the one you're pitching isn't hitting home because you can't really sense that sort of thing over email. So maybe things have kind of changed again over the years in terms of you know, it used to be very much phone and then with uh, at the beginning part of email, email as a as uh, would augment uh, phone conversations. Right now, maybe it's emails drive things, but then phone, the phone, you know, leads augments the communication and the pitching process. Um, fax machine too. I think you're. <laughs> I think you're leaving out the fax machine. You, don't, you, that you don't even know what a fax machine is. Like <laughs> you might be right. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but well, no, but, but it's funny. Still... Initially, instead of emails, and a part of what we do, and clients know as a prospects would notice that. We really rely for the, a lot of our stuff that you guys do is from personal pitching. However, with radio, you still send out large distributions, you know, for, often for radio, and that's fine. But my point was, that used to be done by broadcast fax, mm -hmm. which I used you, to receive faxes I, as an editor at a community newspaper. No, you're you don't even know what that broadcast is. fax. No, I mean I worked in broadcast. So I, we get we only get no, faxes. This is, this from, is like 1998. Okay, because yeah, we only got faxes every once in a while from the police department. <laughs> yeah, you were probably in kindergarten in 1998 or something, but no, I, wish. I mean, I don't, know. I don't know. Five years ago, I was I was still doing event PR and and. The day before the event, we would send out faxes, efax.com. We would use That's not faxes, but through email, we would still so it's all fax. Yeah. Yeah. The general, you know, calendar desk and the, you know, breaking news desk just to get a fax out but, to them last minute. It's, it's so fascinating that fax is now done through email. So it's, yeah. it's and now you have to do technology. Twitter and all the new, even newer forms of reaching out to media and everything. There's... The old things we use a lot less, and there's always something new, and that's another thing we always have to keep our eye on. What is the latest way that reporters and journalists are getting their information? Well, I mean, that's yeah. a great point, and, and leads to another question is, do you, I know I know some of our publicists absolutely do, but do you guys, any of you, use Twitter to pitch or, you know, try to open a door for to get a client place on somewhere. Do you, you do you actively use Twitter? Now, maybe Andrea and Kelly, you might more because you, you guys are more, you do social media, and I don't know about Mallory, but mm -hmm. is that something that's done? I think yeah. it's useful when a lot of times, even with all of our databases and personal contact lists, sometimes you just can't find the exact person that you want to speak to at an outlet. And I find that Twitter can be very useful for that and I also think it can be useful to find out who is talking about a topic that you're pitching. Um, keyword searches, hashtags, trending topics. And you look for journalists yeah. who are talking right. about it. Right, yeah. Molly, do you do that too? Yeah, I definitely w don't necessarily reach out to reporters. I have heard of publicists, you know, tweeting at reporters with certain story ideas. Um, maybe or do you just do a that topic. I do that. Um, I'm very general when I do that because I want to take the conversation offline. So yeah. I just ask them to, you know, um, shoot me a DM, which is a direct message. Or if we're not following each other, because um, that's the way to do that, I I added my email address um, into the tweet, which I don't <coughs> mind doing personally. Some people um, might not like to do that, but yeah, I yeah. I've, I've done it, that. And it's it's. You know, for the people listening who are likely a mix of um, all kinds of authors, publishers, anybody in the industry, or maybe prospective clients, um, it's important for them to, to hear how we do these different things and blend things, blend social media with 
traditional pitching. And, uh, you know, Andrew, maybe, and, and it's, again, it's a question we often get, and I, I know authors are curious about, is it, a lot of people are still believe in kind of the old days again where, you know, well, Dan could pick up a phone and get, you know, the producer of the Tay Show on and get you booked in 10 minutes, and that's normally not the case. But how much cold pitching over the phone do you guys do? And, and um, we know it's a mix of, you know, a lot of it is email now, but Andrew, how much cold pitching do you do on um, the phone? On the phone, I think it's difficult because I think it's difficult to get through to the person if you haven't gone through that intro in email, if they don't know your name yet, um, but so is, which is what I think of as cold calling. So I couldn't say that I initiate a lot of um, media conversations over the phone. It is, again, kind of the way to uh, do the hard sell at the end or whatever. Um, once you have the in, I mean, maybe 20% of my... Yeah. Right, and, and that's, that's what I would have guessed, and, and again, a lot of, it's kind of a romanticized version of a publicist where, you know, you have all these connections, and again, you just get on the phone, and hey, you know, got you booked on GMA, and, and, and still some people think that, because they don't know, and, um, would you say 20%, Michaela? Um, yeah, or a I mean, little and, more. And understand that every, publicist, every publicist has their own... You right. styles and approaches, so. Yeah, I mean, I sort of gauge, you know, how the campaign is progressing and, you know, who I've heard back from um, and the amount of time it's taken to get some feedback. So if I'm pitching an outlet I know should be covering whatever I'm pitching them and I haven't heard back at all, then I pick up the phone and, you know, essentially start from scratch. You do know, you normally get voicemail or do you get a live person? Um, Mix? A mix, and if I do get the voicemail, I don't leave a voicemail message. I think it's something, you know, that's that's something important people should know, is that, you know, they no one checks their voicemail messages anymore either. So when we do come across a voicemail, we don't leave a message. We'll just simply follow up with an email um, follow-up. But Would you say the email, I tried to give you a call? Yeah, yep, I would definitely mention that. You know, I just tried calling, and I wanted to circle back on this. That's really for any feedback. Molly, do you leave messages? I, it depends on who I'm calling. Um, I also, I kind of think it's important again to know who your, your audience is. Um, again, you know, producers, for example, for television shows are younger, and younger people don't like to talk on the phone anymore. So that's, I mean, so yeah, I would, and they hate voice messages. In general, personally, my grandma always leaves voice messages, and I, and now I just hit the trans transcribe. I, yeah. So, I mean, it, I, I would never leave a voicemail for a producer at a TV station anymore. If it's somebody at, you know, if it's a reporter at possibly a newspaper, I may be more inclined, if I really need to get in touch with them, to leave a voicemail, but I will still call back again, now assuming this, that they didn't the, listen to it. Right, now this would be obviously for the, the, the cold pitch, but if you're in process with someone and setting something up, obviously you would leave a message. But mm -hmm. it, Andrew, do you ever leave messages for you know cold calling? I have, but I found this uh, the girl's perspective very enlightening. Maybe I <laughs> should uh, not do that so much. Um, I think too that when you're talking about this romanticized version of picking up a phone and booking GMA, I think culturally we have to be aware that. Um, maybe younger authors or authors in tech fields or business, that is not their romanticized version. Their romanticized version of a publicist is someone who's connected to everyone they want to talk to on Twitter, who's Instagramming with them, who's um, on their mobile phone, you know, multitasking while they're at a networking event in a brewery or something. Like, I think we have, a, so we have such a diversity of clients that I think the romanticized version of what we're doing or the idealized version is different for each client and I think we're very good at working with that client to work in the way that they view it to be the best and pairing them with the publicist that's going to speak their language and work in the way that they'd like their book to be represented. Yeah, and one of the things we do, one of the things we do in the business development is we're talking with a prospective author, we tell them that every all of our publicists are excellent because you all are, but everybody's got their own unique style. And some some publicists, 
you know, one who's been with us the longest, actually, um, is she's an amazing publicist. But if you want to get on a chit chat on the phone and, and do small talk, she's not the right person for you. She's other people like to, I mean, everybody has their own style, and some people, um, and, and that's why it's, um, that's why it all works, because if we just, everybody, we have to adapt to the clients, and, mm -hmm. and clients react and respond differently to different kinds of approaches, and that's why we'd love to have such a diverse array of publicists. Um, so, um, we'll start winding down here, but, uh, Michaela, if you were talking to authors out there who were thinking about hiring a publicity firm, and yes, we'll make the um, absolutely um, self-serving plug and say they should hire us, but yeah. um, what should they know, just briefly, do you, what do you think, based on what you do every day, and you're in the trenches with the media, what do you think they should know about and understand that they may not know about publicity and what we do? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, some things to know is that the media landscape is always changing. You know, editors and reporters are, you know, switching from outlet to outlet um, at any moment. So our Rolodexes are, are constantly changing and developing and um, evolving. So some things to know are to really, you know, keep that in mind and to have an open mind as well um, at the media opportunities that are presented to you um, once you are knee deep in the trenches with us. Um, so that's something. And also to be prepared um, when you are ready for publicity. Um, be prepared to work because it is, you know, a, it's, a, it's a dance with us. Um, we'll ask a lot from you as well, so it's not just sitting back and relaxing and watching the media hits come th come in. Um, it's definitely um, a teamwork approach, and and that's definitely a drive to success for you. So, Andrew, um, I think it's important for authors to know, um, and this isn't a dig at publishers, but the, the way the book industry has changed so much. There's a lot of limitations on what your publisher is going to be able to provide for you. There might have been a time when um, your publisher would provide most of your marketing and you didn't have to be so active, um, but whether you're going with a traditional publisher or a publicity firm, um, really author-led marketing is the watchword. Um, the media wants to know your personality, um, your message about the book. They want something different than what the outlet you interviewed with yesterday had. Um, so again, I think just knowing that industry-wide, um, all your marketing needs are not going to be able to be met by um, your publisher. So there, you really, whether you go with a publicity firm or not, you need to be prepared for rounding out those services. And in, in our proposals and in our conversations with prospective client authors, we, I think what you're getting at is we say, you know, we need a partner in this process. Yes, mm -hmm. you're paying us, we know it's not cheap, but it's author-led marketing um, in combination with what we do is what right. really is usually the recipe for the, <clears throat> the most success. Mallory, anything you want to add? I guess also is that, you know, we are, we're the experts, we really are. We know what we, you know, you may know your book, but we know how to sell your book to the media. So we know what is what aspects of your book are going to be the biggest hook, and you kind of almost have to trust us. And you know, while you also will be working with us, uh, you know, we are going to be writing, you know, your press releases, interview releases, and the messages that we think we take from your book, they're going to be the things that, you know, producers, editors are going to be most attracted to, and we're very confident in that, and we think that that's, you know, what that's the service that we can most importantly offer you, and while, you know, some people think Twitter, social media can just, su that will suffice for publicity, we know that, you know, a combination of both is an important approach. And I think maybe what it comes down to is what you're, what you're referring to is they have to trust us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a big leap of faith when, when authors sign on with us. First of all, there's no guarantees and they're often paying us, you know, it's not cheap and they pay us hard-earned money for, to do what we do. And that's a huge leap of faith right there, knowing that we're not guaranteeing anything, but you have to trust that we know what we're doing. And that's exactly the point. when. And, and we, again, we tell clients this, if they get concerned during a campaign, 
and we tell them, you know, you hired us because we are we're really good at what we do, and you have to trust us and and let us do what we do <clears throat> and work with us as we need and as we talked about do um, you know be an involved partner and also do some author led initiatives, but trust us and. Uh, the vast majority of the time, things uh, things turn out pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we'll wrap it up there. I know you guys have to get on the phone and book about ten interviews with national <laughs> TV outlets right now. Yeah, right. right. Yes. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Smith Publicity All Things Book Marketing Podcast. To reach us and learn about our many book marketing services, visit www.smithpublicity.com or send us an email to info at smithpublicity.com.